Okay, I'd like to call to order the Berlin Boylston Regional School District. Thank you all for taking time out of your evening uh, here, short notice um, in an effort to kind of, uh, in an imperfect world, move us uh, along here a bit and allow the folks in the schools to get ready for the start of the school year. So um, uh, always uh, as a reminder, the meeting's being recorded. There's a potential of your image and our voice may be broadcast. Do we have any public comments this evening uh, as it relates to an item on our agenda? None heard. Um, no, I'm assuming no payroll, payroll warrants this evening. Uh, so we'll move to our consent agenda. And um, we're talking about uh, the open meeting minutes. There was some communication going back and forth as it relates to some edits in the open meeting minutes. So I just want to sort of restate sort of the process for, uh, at, you know, as it relates to open meeting minutes. Uh, we went back and Christy confirmed some of the accuracy of the data. So I think we're all good from that perspective and some of the parent um, survey stuff. But as it relates to, um, you know, obviously our goal as a committee is to maintain an accurate um, to uh, as much as we can effort uh, to get the meeting minutes as accurate as possible. Um, you know, the intention of the meeting minutes and in, 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 in some cases, some, some weeks or some meetings, they are uh, maybe it's a little more in depth than, than they would be and then some is less. But um, the process for the meeting minutes is um, when we get to our meeting, we discuss those, those meeting minutes. If we, if there's changes that people want to have made, we can then put that to a vote and we have the opportunity to um, vote those meeting minutes as is, vote them with the idea that we'll fix something and you always have the opportunity to vote nay uh, as it relates to the open meeting minutes. Um, but sort of in an effort, I, what I don't want to us to get stuck into um, is um, spending too much time focusing on editing the, the meeting minutes from, from previous meetings. I'd like to see us try to um, you know, maybe you know, focus more on kind of moving some of those forward. So, um, Jim, I'd, I'd like to comment on that. Sure, go ahead. Um, in the past, I, when I've seen um, errors in the minutes, I've sent them directly to Christy and Christy has fixed those uh, so that we don't have to take meeting time to address insignificant uh, corrections. Um, so that's not part of the protocol you just described, but I think it's part of the efficiency of getting the meeting minutes done. And um, I, in these meeting minutes, I raised uh, corrections about the data on the parent survey represented in the minutes, and um, I believe they're inaccurate. Um, so I would like to have those fixed as part of the public record. Christy, do you want do you want to talk about the I mean you the check they did from an accuracy on that perspective? I think you're on mute, Christy. It's Christy. Yeah, there I am. I was trying to help Sally get into the meeting also. Um, I checked, I took those numbers directly from the presentation that was provided in the drive. The, um, right. That that was well, inaccurate, actually. The the um, and Jeff, I had written to you about this. The data presented on the slides that were in the presentation were not accurate and were clarified by Carol, and, and maybe it was Jeff too, but certainly by Carol during the meeting when they explained that there was only at like approximately an eighty six percent response rate, which is not reflected in those in those. Um, records the report in the drive uh, and that when it said 92 percent of students blah 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 that's 92 percent of the 86 percent response rate so i feel like um i had written to jeff about that and i i just feel that that data needs to be accurate and it was clarified by carol verbally during the meeting and jeff i think they both added uh clarifications about the total response rate and that the that was all that data on the report was part of 
was reflective of those who had responded to the survey, not to all students. Okay, well, let, we, we can do this. I'll catch up. Let, let's do this because I'm not, I don't want to. Yeah, and, I mean, I, I would suggest we. We, we, we can move the vote. We can move the vote of these minutes off till, till another meeting and I can catch up with Jeff and Christy and um, kind of look at that. I, I want to reevaluate as well. You know, in, in my opinion, meeting minutes aren't meant to be a verbatim, a, you know, a verbatim transcript of a meeting. It's meant to sort of clarify and, and catch the essence of the meeting as well as more importantly, track the votes, right, for public. So I, I want to I wanna maybe talk to Jeff and Christy about what we're doing from a meeting minute stamp, standpoint. But from an analytical data standpoint, that's fine. I think we can look to uh, fix that. But um, if nobody has an issue with that, what I'll do is I'm going to, I'll move the vote for these meeting, meet, these meeting, meeting minutes off until next week. Or off until our next meeting, I apologize. Next Is that okay with everybody? Yep. Okay. All right, moving through the agenda, then what we're going to, uh, the next topic on the agenda. So um, there's been, there's a lot of, uh, over the last week, released by MIAA and, and Department of Education as, a, as it relates to uh, the schools and preparedness as it relates to the sporting events. Um, Jeff and I started those conversations. Uh, there was some votes that need to be had in effort to be prepared for the start of school and ultimately sports, we all know, starts before the start of school. Um, so um, in an effort to try to move the process along and allow Ms. Picaro and Diane to get prepared for school sports, um, rather than push it off to another meeting, uh, what I did was I asked Jeff to make an introduction introduction of what he's asking for today and invite Mr. Bacaro and Diane to give us updates on that this evening. Um, and we can, uh, if there's any discussion around that or anybody has any concerns about that, we can discuss that after uh, these folks have an opportunity to present. So Jeff, I'll pass it off to you. Okay, thank you. And thank you for agreeing to this meeting. I know these things, we have a lot of things that are time sensitive and we get, we get information in, in little pieces and we have to make quick decisions. So um, the thing I wanted, a couple things. The first thing I wanted to talk about was uh, sports. And I've asked Diane and Matt to come and, 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 and join in also. The issue is uh, whether or not to allow students who, who have chosen remote learning to participate in, in sports. Uh, this, the other piece of this is whether or not to allow students who, if we went fully remote, to participate in sports. My feeling is that the, the most important thing here is to keep students engaged. And one of the, one of the primary ways students engage uh, in, in, in the school community is through sports. My recommend, my recommend, so I don't make a distinction between whether we're in hybrid and a student is choosing remote learning and whether we are completely in remote. If sports are being played in the state, I think we should, we should allow our remote students to also participate in sports. Um, that's gonna be my, recommenda my recommendation and what ultimately I'd like you to vote on. But I've asked Matt to come because we haven't had any updates on the state of sports right now in Massachusetts. Um, so I was gonna ask Matt to do that, just some of the technical things that are going on. And then to have Diane, just to speak briefly on, um, just, just from a principal's perspective, the, the social emotional impact that she's seen uh, on, on students who play sports and the importance of sports, and especially at the high school level. So Matt, do you wanna just stop by just giving like a quick update? Um, you know, I know a lot's been going on. I know you, the AD, AD is still working, especially this week trying to get things going. Um, but just to give just a quick update on what's going on in the sports world, um, including I know they just added a new season, which I don't know much about, but if you could just quickly go over that stuff and then we can go to Diane. All right, so let's, um, we'll first start with the fall season. 
Um, sports are, are slated to start for the fall season, uh, September 18th. So that's when practices and everything gets underway with the games starting after two weeks on October 5th. That, that's what would be starting for this fall season. What they're doing is uh, if you are moderate to low risk, they're gonna be having the sports season that we will have in the fall, boys and girls soccer, cross country, golf, field hockey, those sports will be going off with following strict guidelines as we go. And they will be moving football and cheer into that other season that um, Jeff is talking about. And now it's gonna be called fall two, but it actually will be starting towards the end of February in February, April, and in some of May. Um, at this point in time, they will allow practices in cohorts for football and cheer, but, um, and then the season will actually begin further on down the line. Uh, there will be, that's, that's the plan for there to be four seasons. The time frames, exactly how they're gonna work out, they could switch up some a little bit, but this first season, starting September 8th, game starting October 5th for those sports that I mentioned. We'll go somewhere to the beginning, mid-November. Um, again, they're all um, type, uh, tournament type stuff is not gonna be represented this year on sports. I mean, it's gonna be, you know, get those kids out there participating in sports this year. Second season will be hockey and basketball which is what affects us. You know, there's other sports that doesn't really affect us, but that'll go from somewhere in November, December range to February. That second, the third season, which is fall two, that's the one for football. I think volleyball gets moving there, but again, the only ones that affect our kids really is football. Um, that will be again, February, March, April. And then lastly, all the spring sports and maybe a couple move in, but I don't think that it will affect us at the end would be, um, you know, softball, baseball, um, lacrosse, track. I might be missing one right there, but again, that'll, and that'll run till the end of June, might even to the beginning of July, but all these dates can change as it goes, but that's really how the four seasons are going to work. Um, and, you know, they're, whether you're hybrid, remote, or in school full-time, their plan is to, there will be, those schools will be allowed to have sports. They can. Um, I don't know if I mean, you know, and uh, the, the guidelines keep coming out from the DPH, the EEA, and MIAA, and we're working, ADs coming up with all of, at, at least in our, in the Midwalk um, League, 26 schools, to come up with strict protocols following as we go. And it, it is a work in progress as, I, as we're going. Matt, when you talk about uh, the green and white, are you talking about green and white sports? Um, so the, the, the sports that are, you know, low to moderate, soccer, golf, uh, cross country, um, field hockey, that those are the those are the ones that we're going to start going with in the fall because that we can as long as following those guidelines we can get them out on the fields. Whereas football is still considered more high risk or or even or even cheer even though we don't have fall cheer. Um, those are being moved into that auxiliary season as we move on and as different information comes we'll see how those sports can be played. Any questions on some of that stuff or more stuff you'd like to hear? Any questions from the committee for Matt? Um, I guess I had a question. So tryouts and that sort of stuff start September 18th. Yes. Um, my second question is what about like busing to games? Again, that, that, you know, that is a whole work in progress, which is a lot of work to be done up to that point with all different restrictions on the buses, on how, I mean, everything, but rest assured, we, we've been, I've been meeting with them throughout the summer with the ADs. We've actually got ahead of 
before any of these came out in the event that stuff was allowed to be happening, we knew there would be restrictions. So although there's still a lot of work to do, we got ahead of the game and we have all different subcommittees going on right now trying to work through all different protocols. And then it'll also end up being school specific too. There'll be, you know, we'll, we'll have what we work through and then there'll be how we can work through it for schools also. And so Jeff, are, are we, sorry, Susan, I didn't mean to interrupt you, I apologize. Um, are we allowing, what about students who opt into remote learning even when in a hybrid scenario? Are we, uh, are we allowing those kids to participate in sports? That would be my recommendation. So whether, if we're in hybrid and those students choose remote, I'd recommend we let them participate in sports. And if we go to a full remote, if the season's still going on, I would recommend that we continue to allow all students who are playing sports to continue playing sports for obvious reasons, you know, because we would just, what would happen is we'd, they'd be participating in sports and then we just pull it from them. So um, in any remote situation. Well, I, that's the part I want to understand. Um, so I, I, I've reviewed the, um, the guidance, you know, talking about the low, moderate, and high risk sports and the modifications to those sports um, to make them safe, as safe as possible. <clears throat> um, and I, I understand, I, I believe that whether students participate or not should be based on the, the district's position that whether they're hybrid or remote, not individual decisions. So I support the idea that if the district is in hybrid and families have opted for remote, that they should be able to participate the same as anybody else in the district in hybrid mode. Um, what I don't understand is the, the if, if the district moves into remote, learning um that's i i i need to hear some uh, description of these scenarios i guess i uh, presume that that's either because um the communities themselves have an increased risk of the virus and so they've become a red zone on the state map right or not necessarily a red zone. I mean, it just could be, it could be, well, there's two things. So I, I understand, what, I think I understand what you're saying. So if the governor closes the schools, if there's a close order, then everything stops, obviously. But that's, you're talking statewide now, right? Statewide. Yeah. But there could be, I mean, one of the things that I, I said, and a, a parents have asked me and teachers have asked me, what would it take for you to, to close the school and go all, all remote? And I said one case because of tracking issues and all of that stuff. So we set, I know that the, you know, one of the guidelines is 10% to open schools or to close them. We set it at 5% and one case will go remote. But just because one case, if we get one case, we close the schools, that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody on that sports team is, um, you know, has, is, is positive. Now, what I would say is that if that happens, if we had to close the school because of a case of COVID-19, I would be in favor of putting something in place like all of the athletes have to be tested before they come back because we don't know. So I think that, I think with precautions in place, which are reasonable, we can continue to play sports. Um, so in, in that kind of scenario, uh, uh, I mean, in some of these situations, we're, we would be playing teams from other towns? I think, you know, in, in some situ situations, yes. Um, but, you know, we would be looking at, obviously, in constant conversation with um, the other school districts, um, taking a, a look at, you know, their numbers. You know, we'll have a, a schedule that is that is shortened. Um, typically, we play anywhere from 18 to 20 games. I think, Matt, you said we're looking at playing. Um, 10, yeah. 10 to 12 and only a set number of teams in like a bubble. There's only going to be, we'll be, have like a pod. 
of who we will play. It will only, it'll be geographically close also. And, and all of these schools, all of these other districts, Susan, they're going through the same safety protocols we're going through. And I, because I know there's a concern with, okay, so we have our school and we're in an enclosed environment. Now you introduce other students from other schools. And it, of course, there's a risk involved there, but those, as Matt mentioned, the ADs have been going through safety protocols and trying to unify some of those, all of them. And um, so they're going through all of the same safety, the safety protocols that we're going through. And to me, if, 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 you, if we're in a hybrid model and we say, okay, the remote students that we have are allowed to play and we play another team and through that contact, someone on our teams become positive. To me, that, there's really no difference between that than if we were fully remote and that situation happened. The risk is, the risk seems to be the same. And so I, I don't see where there'd be a difference. I, I don't feel like they're the same. I mean, I feel like if we're going into remote, it's sort of our, our local way of saying, we're going into lockdown for a couple of weeks because the risk just became elevated. Elevated, but not, you know, we're not, we're not in a, we're not in a catastrophe. I mean, we're, no, just no. Trying, to be, we're no. trying to be, we're trying to be cautious. I mean, we're saying that building has what, 560, 570 kids in it. We're saying if there's one positive case, we're going to close the school down. That's not a need, I don't think, to panic. And I wouldn't think that it would be a need to, um, to say, okay, no sports. Now, I'm not saying that's what you're insinuating, but what I'm saying is that the, the reason we close the school down might not be because you know, 40 people are, are positive. If we had a case like that, 40, 50 kids are positive, then you know, we would probably consider not having sports, but that's a little different situation. And so I think some of this is, is we, we haven't been through this before. So I don't know what's gonna happen. I guess I see this as just sort of, it feels inconsistent to me to say uh, one, one child uh, tests positive and we're gonna close the entire school, but we're not gonna close the entire field. I, I, it feels, it just feels inconsistent to me. I don't, I don't, I don't know how to reconcile those different postures in those two scenarios. But I think that's a little too linear the way you're thinking about it. One kid's positive out of 570. We close the school as a precaution because we can't trace it. But I don't think it's an, I don't think it's necessarily a reason to, to stop kids from playing sports. If 40 or 50 kids were positive, then I could see it. Well, where I, I think there's also a, a difference. I think there's also a difference of, you know, you're talking about, you know, 580 students in the conf confines of a building. Um, and versus you're out in the open with air um, on large fields following um, following protocols. I mean, you know, I, I see it every morning when I drive past a gym in Westboro, you know, the CrossFit, every, it's all outside now um, and spread out with certain precautions versus inside. And I, and I think that, that that is really the, the, the big difference is you're, you know, all sharing inside that building that, you know, that same air that this, you know, the circulation is different than being in um, open and fresh air. Yeah, I can see that that, that is a difference. Uh, an sure. Another another piece is, in, in my opinion, majority of these students are already playing sports. So majority of these students are already going back to school, participating in sports. And the sports that aren't being played currently are the ones that won't be played like football, right? So, but club soccer teams, uh, lacrosse programs, track, th these kids are already playing sports today. Um, and, and, you know, so um, 
from a safety standpoint, I suppose, right? From a health and safety standpoint, that we it's already been introduced, right? And there's already measures I look at it as there's already measures in place and controls in place for sports, right? It's actually, in my opinion, it's actually more of a known right now than it than it than school, right? Um, you go to the soccer games, you go to the fields. There's a lot of mask wearing. There's a lot of things in place. I suspect a lot of those same controls will be put in place in high school sports, right? Wearing of masks, coaches wearing their masks, single parents attending, that type of stuff. A lot of the stuff I read. And actually, in some cases, will be even even more stringent, more stringent than yeah, what yeah. they're doing today with their club and recreational summer program. So um, I see it, sports as even a more controlled environment than we know as it relates from the school system right now. But um, so that's just, that would just be my thought, my opinion on it. I think it opens up the way the impact of, 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 of letting students continue to play sports versus uh, just pulling it away from them. You know, if, if we go remote, students are still going through the learning process. They just have a different model of doing it. But sports would just be pulling that, that away from them. And, you know, one of the reasons I asked Diane to come, uh, to come and speak today is to talk about the social emotional impact of, of sports. And, um, you know, we have kids who just come to school. And that's, the, that's the reason we get them here in the first place. Um, same thing applies to music, but or extracurricular activities. But I was wondering could, if we could have Diane just speak to that, and that might clarify some things for you also, Susan. Sure, and I just want to piggyback off of what Jim had said, you know, um, you know, the state has actually, you know, for the same reason we would be looking at, um, you know, have done a lot of work to get um, youth sports up and running. And because we, we know the benefits, obviously, of it uh, that goes well beyond the physical aspect of it. Um, you know, we're in a time where we are all um, dealing with a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, depression. Um, and, you know, high school sports at that developmental level um, is so important for a lot of our students. We have in our, in our fall sports have the highest percentage of students participating um, in those sports. And it gives students, you know, it's the motivation for some students. It's a reason why they come to school. Um, but it's also, you know, beyond that, it, it's teaching, you know, students time management skills. Um, it is teamwork, working collaborative, collaboratively with others, team building, um, and, you know, to have them, you know, who are already playing their youth sports, and then all of a sudden say, you know what, no high school sports. That's very, you know, it can be very, very difficult. And also for those high school athletes who are varsity athletes, they are, you know, some of them may be looking at um, continuing playing at the collegiate level. And to not have them, um, you know, have the opportunity to potentially, you know, be seen by a college recruiter, um, et cetera, maybe, um, you know, it, it could be impacted um, by that as well. But I think for the most part, the overall benefit of participating in, you know, in high school athletics, um, you know, is so important to the development of, you know, a large percentage of our students that I would hate to see us um, take that away from them. Um, you know, obviously the protocols that are in place um, or that will be in place are gonna be looked at by um, so many eyes um, not only with the MIAA, but the athletic directors as well, the, the boards of health, the CDC. Um, so I really think it would be extremely beneficial to us to have our, you know, our students be able to continue to participate regardless of what, uh, you know, mode of learning that we, we happen to be in. I don't wanna take all the time if anybody else wants to comment. Uh, I will just say that I, um, uh, I understand all those benefits and agree with all those benefits. <clears throat> I played a lot of sports myself when I was in high school. Um, 
I don't think, I, I agree that lots of people are looking at all the protocols, et cetera, but they're looking at them uh, broadly and looking at the um, level of risk of play and modifying those, et cetera. But they're not looking at your local community health rates, your, your virus rates. Um, they're, not, they're not accounting for your local uh, Berlin-Boylston status with the virus. That's the piece that concerns me. Well, we look at that. And that's, that's what I was saying. That's you go to remote. That, that's what I was saying. No, but for anything, you know, if, if, if there's an outbreak in the community and we have to shut the schools, that's a little bit different than closing the school down because one person is positive. The rates in the town, both of our towns is, is 1% over the last 14 days. I understand we're starting in a good place. Yeah, we're starting in a great place. And, and I, I, like I said, this is not a linear thing. We have a break, an outbreak in the schools. There's an outbreak in the town. And, and you know, we go up five, six, seven percent. We're going to have to reconsider this position, of course, um, because that means that there's enough of it in the town that it, it, it may affect those students who are playing sports. But if you had one student in the school and you say, okay, well, I know that student, that student doesn't play any sports. It's one student that the rates in the town are still 1% because you can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, if the rates in, in the town are low, then we can keep, the, we can keep the, the school open. But if the rates in the town are low, but there's one case in the school, you can't play sports. If the rates are low, the rates are low. If there's an outbreak, that's a different story. If the town goes up, that's a different story. And so I think, you know, it's not linear. We'll have to, we'll have to continue to look at this. Um, you, I mean, you're talking uh, some kind of arbitrary threshold that I don't understand. You, you, I'm not talking about an arbitrary you're threshold. You're talking about outbreaks. The National Education Association set it at 5%. I think the CDC sets it at 10%. We went with the lower number. That's not, a, it's not an arbitrary number. Um, at all. To shut this, to sh go to remote, you mean? Is that what you're saying? That What's the, the yeah. You're so, talking about the number of students within the school uh, meeting a certain threshold to go to remote. Y yeah. Um, I mean, you, I, if we had one case, I said we were going to go to remote right. as a school district. But I don't think that's a reason to stop sports necessarily if it's one student. If there's an outbreak in the school or if- What, Jeff, what is an outbreak? Well, 20 kids, 10 kids. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, there doesn't seem to be a clear number. You can't but can but you, I, I can't give you a concrete answer. If, if you want like, okay, check this box, check this box. It's not gonna work that way because the virus doesn't work that way. So. We're trying to just give you a, the scenario to say, you know, the question is whether, is, is not whether we're following safety protocols because we're doing that. So that's not the question. The question is whether a student who's remote should play, be able to play sports. Whether they're remote if we're in a hybrid or whether they're remote because the school's remote. I can't go through every single scenario with you if we're remote. It could be one kid. It could be 20 kids. So we're going to have to look at that and see what the risks are and look at multiple factors. If we have, a, if we have more than one it, and, it, and it's accompanied by um, a high rate in the town, the town goes from 1% 1, 1 positivity to 6%, and we have five cases in the school, that might be a reason to say we can't, we can't play sports either. Everything has to close. <clears throat> but nobody can give you those answers. I mean, you know, we can't give you a chart that, you know, we click stuff off because I, I don't think it's going to work like that. I, I, have, I, I suspect, I'm, 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 sorry, I'm, go ahead, Cliff. Go uh, ahead, Cliff. Go ahead. Okay. Are you sure, Jim? Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. Yep, sorry. So I, I'm, in, I'm in support of um, <clears throat> students being allowed to play sports no matter what version of the school school program they're in, whether they're on hybrid or remote. I think that there are students, they should have the opportunity to participate if that's their desire. 
Um, I, I'm having a little bit of a problem wrapping my mind around some of the scenarios, but, but that's not my question. Um, um, Matt, you talked about, um, Matt talked about um, that our teams would be in a bubble to keep the number of um, school communities that we'd be interacting with to a minimum. Yep. Is that, is that fair? Did I, did I summarize that correctly? Yeah, that would be, that's going to be the general consensus for all schools to be in just, these are the teams you compete with. Okay, great. So um, we've been talking about what happens if potentially the infection rate in our community, one of our two communities or both communities should rise above um, a certain standard. Um, my question is, what happens if one of the teams in the bubble comes from a community where th there's been a spike in infection? Um, uh, that would, if it was our school system, would shut us down. What have you, I don't suppose you've um, gamed out all the scenarios, but I'm just wondering like what would happen in something like that? I, I mean, I don't know officially what would happen, but I would imagine that would mean if that's, that school wouldn't be competing anymore. We wouldn't be playing with that school if they reached to that level. Or I mean, I, again, I don't, I don't want to no, go I, and, yeah. and speculate, but I mean, if it was a level, if their level is higher than ours, and do you know what I mean? Then, then right. we don't play them. If that's, if that's, yeah. I mean, that could be. I don't. I, there is a lot to be worked out, but something in that zone of those two scenarios. So you know, I, I'll confess, I'm um, not as well versed in school sports as the rest of the panel here. But, and I can't even remember all the towns that are in the Midwest League. So how bad is that? Um, it's constantly growing. Okay. All right. So what, what would be like the biggest community in the league? Just how oh, I, it, you know, they'll, we, <laughs> they would, it's gonna be, it'll be right around us. I mean, and I, I'm, I'm not even going to start giving you who it necessarily will be, but you know, I'll, I'll put it like this. Like it would be like us, West Boylston, Clinton, Shrewsbury, and I'm making names up. I'm not, these are not who it is, but sure, it would be, sure, sure. It is, you know, and I doubt that Shrewsbury would be in it because they are a much bigger school, but that's not really what necessarily they're looking for. They're looking for to keep everyone tight geographically okay. and also the same type size school as best they can. Okay, so, so you, I don't think you mentioned that the first time, so that's good to hear. Geographically close and right sized. Correct. Okay. That that's really really helpful. One more thing. Yep. Um, I know a comment was made earlier. I don't mem remember who who did, saying that um, that the protocols for like uh, spectators. I'm just going to use the word spectators, um, and other things related to the the um, the play will be far more strict than what you might see in a club scenario and and i find that encouraging because i don't have anyone participating in club sports but i have observed club sports happening around me and i've been appalled by what i've just casually observed about the lack of masks people being clustered together parents being in a huddle talking no masks it's like i don't know that's not encouraging to me and um, so I'm glad to hear that there will be regulations and you believe they're stricter than those. Yeah, That's a good thing. Definitely will be stricter. Well, how is, how is that enforced? That, is it just a, you're uh, hoping it will be a cultural norm or how is that enforced? I mean, that, uh, the, the administrator of the game, the officials, um, you know, it, what, me, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, huh? Well, I think some of it would be up to the coaches because uh, isn't there a regulation, Matt, about not having more than 25 or 30 players on the field at one time? So that could, that could be, I know there's a regulation like that. So that could be done by the coaches. But there's also a regulation, I thought, for the amount of spectators. Like oh, this, oh, this, yes. But this is youth sports at this point. But again, there will definitely be Spectators, I mean, I'll have, you know, however that is done, whether I, I mean, obviously I'm sure I'll have help, but counting the spectators, um, you know, we're gonna change, 
rosters of kids. There's only going to be a maximum of what you could have or who could go to the game. Or there's, there is, there's going to be a lot, a lot of rules. And I think, you know, and I think also Matt and I had talked about this the other day that we will have um, expectations, you know, for the athletes regarding, um, you know, what we expect them to, to do as far as, you know, wearing masks, um, et cetera, and Wonderful. protocol for what happens if, if they're not following those expectations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, questions from the committee? And I just want to, sorry, go ahead, Angela. Were you gonna, no? Oh, I was just gonna say, at, at first I was having trouble understanding why a parent or a family who was choosing to go remote, why the student would want to play sports. But I think Diane in her first comments kind of cleared that up for me about how it is different because it's outside and the student benefit and all that. So I can agree with that. Also, I, did, I did, you know, it's reassuring to me, like the bubble and the geographic, because it seems like most of the COVID hotspots are really geographic hotspots. So that's reassuring to me as well. And just with all, all these sorts of things that's happening everywhere with a, a testing to being healthy or um, signing protocols of behavior um, is great. And I'm, I'm you know, I guess I'm just in support of the superintendent's recommendation on this. I do have a quick question, Jeff. If it's a, uh, if one kid gets uh, tested positive or becomes positive that's in sports already, does that shut that down? Yeah, that would be, if it's, if it's someone who's on a team, that would be a reason to, again, that, again, there are a lot of scenarios that would be a reason to, to, okay. to that sport. I, I figured that, but I just want yeah. to clarify that. Yeah. yeah, and you know what? And I, again, we're not trying to be evasive about this, but this is our first time through also. And, you know, as, as Matt and Diane have said, we, we have a lot of sa safety protocols in place. Um, but you also have to realize that even with all those protocols in place, we don't know what this is going to look like. You know, we might be a week into this and think, it, this is not going to work, or it, you know, or it might be great. So, we're not going to just make the decision and let it go. We're going to continue to monitor it because if we did have a situation like Keith just laid out, and then we didn't shut it down, it it then affects the school environment, and we don't want that either. So, uh, I, well, we don't have all the answers. Um, Nobody does. No. I think having that flexibility, like you just talked, is another thing that's reassuring to me that, you know, saying yes to this tonight doesn't mean that we have to keep sports going no matter what. Yeah, Based and I guess the happens. vote would have to be something along the lines that the, that the administration would have the ability to, even though, you, even though the vote is to let students play, that in, in, if, if, if we didn't think it was safe, that the administration has the ability to just uh, to stop it. Um, is that, that might be a your when, you, season, right? when you say the administration, do you mean you? Me. So I have a request. Um, I think, I think your description of this situation is, is, as, um, excuse me, your description of the situation is fluid, um, and probably will remain fluid throughout the whole year, if that's how long this all takes. Um, I would just encourage Jeff that you keep committee members well informed and in the loop. I mean, we're not going to be second guessing your decisions. I, that's not our role. But, you know, I don't think any one of us would want to be surprised by something that suddenly everyone else was aware of, but we weren't. Um, Absolutely. And I think where it's, it's so fluid. I mean, you're going to be busy problem solving on the fly and um, keeping the school committee informed might not be high on your list, but um, as because you have to solve the problem on the fly, but I would encourage you to keep us informed and to get our support. I mean, you don't need our vote, but you do need our support. So absolutely. 
Um, it seems to me like um, this is making me think of the policy language we've been dealing with with some of the COVID uh, related policy changes that uh, Came, some came for a first read to the school committee in the last meeting. More are coming for a first read in the next meeting. And um, those policies, actually is sports, uh, two, I think there are two sports policies, sports related policies that are coming up at the policy committee meeting on September 3rd uh, to come to the school committee for a first read shortly after. And it seems to me that there is language that's um, being added to a lot of these <clears throat> policy references underneath the COVID um, uh, supplemental policy, EBC, that we talked about last, last meeting, uh, where they, they state specifically that the superintendent has the authority to uh, propose changes to the school committee or to inform the school committee or to just make changes independently, regardless of the school committee. Um, and it seems to me that some of the language that we're using in those policies would be appropriate here uh, and that we could, will need to um, reflect this conversation in the policies themselves that are coming before the school committee in the coming weeks. Um, and so that po that policy language, I think Cliff would say uh, some reference, um, if you recall, some of those policies, the superintendent could make changes, but had to keep the school committee informed. So we sh could use that language. Oh, um, you're on mute, Cliff. Did you say we're meeting on the third? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I don't have it in my calendar. That just freaked me out. <laughs> right, yes. Christy can confirm that, but I think so. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that's very important to keep the committee in the loop, particularly since it seems that one of the things that I'm uncomfortable with here is that the, some of the criteria that you would use to make a decision about um, closing down sports or certain sports um, are, are not particularly clear. I hear you thinking through some scenarios on your feet uh, right now, but I feel like some of these criteria, I mean, you can say you want a lot of flexibility, you've got to see how it's going to play out, blah, blah, blah. But um, I feel like some of these criteria, we should be able to anticipate. Some of these scenarios we should be able to anticipate. And uh, I would like to see better clarity on the criteria for making these decisions. And I, in the absence of them at this point, I would like when you inform the school committee of uh, how scenarios are playing out that those criteria sh should be clarified going forward. I feel like they should be not, they, we should have a, a better grip on them. Well, we have guidelines. I mean, we, we have guidelines, we have general guidelines, but I think that's all we can have at this point. I mean, we could have, you could go through 50 scenarios now and we would, you know, we could probably say, oh, we didn't think of that. One. We didn't think of that one. Um, so, I mean, we did, we do have general guidelines for closing the schools down. And, you know, this, this issue with the sports has just come up. We just got some some guidance from the state on it and, and you know, just start thinking this through. And I think using the same guidelines for closing the school to also close down a sport would make sense. It's what Keith just laid out. What if one person gets COVID-19? Um, beyond just somebody who's positive, you know, if it's, if it's one person who's positive, you close down the school. If it's one person in a sport, that's positive, you close down the sport. Um, but in between that, there's, there's, there's a number of scenarios that I'm sure we haven't anticipated. Um, if we, you know, in uh, two months from now, we have this conversation, it's probably gonna look different than it looks today because there's a lot of things we don't know. Um, 
mean, there's a lot of things we don't know about the teaching and learning part, the, the hybrid portion. So, um, you know, we'll stay on it. We're gonna stay on it. We'll certainly keep you informed. Um, but we're just looking for some approval to move forward with these things and to, um, you know, so let them play out. And, and there's, a, there's an aspect of this that we just have to get into it and, and, and see what happens. Um, nobody, okay. nobody has the answers. This is not like regular school where you can go back and look at, you know, 100 years of history and education, or something like that. There's, there's not a lot of data on this. Um, this isn't a health and safety, well, it is to some degree issue, but Matt, you talked about the challenges of transportation. I, I, don't, I don't envy you <laughs> trying to solve that. Um, not only, for example, transportation to a game, but also how do we get kids here for, I get them to the fields for practice when it's not their day to be at school or, or they're fully remote, how do they get here? And, and man, I don't know how you're gonna solve that problem. I don't know how you're gonna get all those kids transported around. Right. Um, but good luck. There's a lot. There's a lot to be. There's still a lot to be done over the next couple of weeks. Yeah. There's good transportation for club teams. So, right. <laughs> just but, saying. But we don't. But we don't. You know, we wouldn't want someone disadvantaged because they're doing fully remote and there's no transportation. You know that. Yeah, that, I understand. But that's. I'll let you solve that problem. <laughs> <laughs> What if, what if this sidelines, the spectators uh, on the sidelines start to look more like what Cliff was describing and the club teams that he'd observed? Like, you know, what, what do you do then? Is there anything that you do about that? Yeah, so again, you know, Matt is, Matt's the administrator at the games. There's also officials, um, you know, that are hired with expectations. Um, you know, just as if there is a, a, a major safety issue within, you know, the game or on the sidelines with parents, et cetera, there's a protocol to follow. And if it's not followed, I mean, Matt and or the officials have the right to stop the game. Okay, thank you. And I think, again, that, that's going to be a learning process. I was an administrator when when uh, all of a sudden sp smoking wasn't allowed in the games and uh, you know, just trying to enforce that. Um, I was called names. I can't even, I, I wouldn't even occur to me to, so uh, I, Jeff. <laughs> this is gonna be a process too. And I don't envy Matt either. Okay. Uh, if there's no no more questions, just a reminder, right? We're only voting on tonight's vote is only to allow Jeff and Matt and Diane and team to start the process, right? To vote to allow students in whichever format we are in to participate in sports, right? So uh, we're not necessarily solving um, all of the issues, but that's what our vote tonight uh, is focused on. So I, I would like expectation. That. Uh, that vote also, Jim, to include, officially, to include the language of the superintendent providing regular updates on uh, how this is unfolding to the school committee. I don't necessarily think the vote needs to include that, um, because I would expect that superintendent, athletic director, principals will be keeping us in the loop in that. I would prefer... I don't see a reason to add that to the vote because it's really not, that's not of the nature of what we're voting on this evening. We're really just kicking off what the MIA has put into place, which is they're allowing sports. And all we're doing right now tonight is voting on, um, all we're really, all we're voting on tonight is to allow students remote or hybrid to participate in sports. So I would, I would be reluctant to add that in there unless there's a, a, a committee consensus that they want to add some wording like that around there? Okay, so we'll keep the vote the way it is. We'll keep the vote the way it is today. Um, 
Okay, any other discussion as it relates to uh, the topic before we adjourn and go into executive session? So just as a reminder for the rest of the committee, you have an email in your inbox for the link for our executive session, okay? So that's where we'll be going to and we will be, be coming back into uh, open session to vote on this topic as well as the topic we'll be discussing in uh, executive session. So if I could please have a motion to adjourn the Berlin Boyles Regional School District uh, and go into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining MOU between BBRSD and BBEA and with the intent to return into open session. I'll make that motion. motion. I made the Thank motion. You. Thank you, Cliff. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Angela. Roll call vote. Angela? Aye. Susan? Aye. Cliff? Aye. Lori? Aye. Keith? Aye. 